Well, such wonderful words to sing together to our Savior. Good morning, brothers and sisters from Spring Creek Bible Church. We uh, greet you on behalf of the elders there, uh, and it is truly a joy to be filling the pulpit this morning uh, for Pastor John. I have a deep respect for the ministry that happens here at Grace Bible Church uh, and the sufficiency of God's word that is held to so, so strongly and so faithfully here at this church. Well, as we do every Sunday, open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. We will be reading from God's inspired, sufficient, and inerrant word that is living and active and able to pierce our hearts and cause us to grow in him, to become more like Christ here this morning. Let me pray for us as we ask God to help us this morning. Father, we come to you because you are the one who has created us. You are the one who has worked in our hearts to cause regeneration to happen. You are the one that causes us to continue to grow into the image of your Son. We ask this morning that you would use your word in our hearts. That your Holy Spirit would work through this message to make us more like Christ this morning. We want to love you, we want to worship you, we want to pursue you as we ought. Help us to do that through this text because of your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, more than ever in recent history, both individually and corporately as a country, I feel like we are standing in the middle of seismic change. So much has happened culturally in this world around us. So much has happened individually in our own lives. It feels like the last year and a half has been more like 15 years as events have passed us. Uncertainty feels more certain. And for those of us like myself that enjoy the consistency of certainty, this has been a time for all of us to run back to our Savior the rock that never changes, the truth that never morphs. Our circumstances have shifted. True knowledge is being attacked. Historical events are being rewritten and changed in history books and espoused as truth in the name of education. Worldly justice is being redefined and changed through wokeness as evangelicals try to find racial and cultural reconciliation outside of the cross of Jesus Christ. What was common sense knowledge is being rewired and changed in our culture. The change quotient is high. And as we sit in the middle of all of this, this changing world, we're trying to assimilate some normalcy in the midst of change. We continue to work. We continue to eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We continue to sleep. There's a consistency that's necessary. And yet we recognize that uncertainty is simply a function of humanity. There is nothing uncertain from God's perspective. He has planned the future. He has made us. He has put us here with a purpose. And so there is nothing uncertain that you or I will face this morning or in the years to come that is outside God's perfect plan. Today we are going to look at a text that brings not just stability in certainty, but joy in the midst of difficult and changing circumstances. Biblical joy is a theme of the book of Philippians, and it's not because Paul's life was stable from a human perspective. 
Joy is one of the reasons that Paul writes this letter to the church in Philippi. He wanted them to experience deep joy in whatever circumstances they were to face. That's why this epistle is known as the epistle of joy. Listen to what Lenski says about Philippians. He says, joy is the music that runs through this epistle, the sunshine that spreads over all of it. That's such a beautiful way to describe this precious letter for us this morning. If we're going to have this joy, there's a requirement for us. If we're going to have this kind of stabilizing joy, there's a foundation that is necessary. In fact, in the verses just prior to the text we're going to look at this morning, Paul prays this in verse 9. He says, And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. Joy and true knowledge are inseparably tied at the hip. True knowledge is the rocket fuel that propels joy. On the other hand, emotions are what propel happiness. If our joy is nothing more than happiness, then our circumstances will control our emotions. And we will miss out on God's gift of biblical stabilizing joy in the face of uncertainty. It wasn't Paul's circumstances that helped him maintain a Godward focus. In fact, Paul was separated not by choice from these believers that he loved in Philippi. He wasn't able to FaceTime them or call them or Skype them or text them. He was only able to send this letter to them. How is it that Paul did not crumble under the weight of his circumstances? How did he not waver amid such uncertainty in his life? I want to suggest this morning that there are three stabilizing truths that fueled biblical joy in his circumstances. And these three stabilizing truths will fuel our joy in any circumstance as well. Uncertainty becomes less important because these three stabilizing truths remain unchanged in any situation, even when Paul was in prison. If you're a note taker this morning, I've broken the text into three points. The first point is gospel progress that we're going to see in verses 12 through 14. The second is gospel preaching that we're going to see in 15 through 18. And finally, gospel provision in 19 through 20. Let's read Philippians 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 20 and focus most of our attention on verses 12 through 20 this morning. But we'll begin in verse 1 just to set the context this morning. Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Christ Jesus, To all the saints in Christ who are in Philippi, including the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all, because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers of grace with me. For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be sincere and blameless until the day of Christ, having been filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ to the glory of God. 
and praise of God. Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Well, let's look at the first stabilizing truth that will fuel our joy in any circumstance, and that is gospel progress in verses 12 through 14. We all enjoy missionary stories of the gospel going forth, the gospel spreading to the ends of the earth. We love reading about revivals and the nations being converted to Christ. Yet what we see in this text is not the spread of the gospel through glamorous means. In fact, the gospel was spreading through a man who was in prison. Naturally, these believers in Philippi were sincerely concerned about Paul, who was their spiritual father in the faith, the one who had a very real hand in this church being established and the gospel coming to Philippi. We could go back to Acts 16 and read the account of Paul and Lydia and the Philippian jailer who were both miraculously saved because of the witness of Paul. After this, there's a church that is started in Philippi and Paul has to make a quick exit from Philippi. Put yourself in the shoes of these believers in Philippi. You just heard the most amazing news that your soul is now rescued and you have a hope and a future in heaven. And the very man who came to tell you this good news now has to leave quickly. Their affection for him, their concern for him must have been great. In fact, their concern was heightened. They sent Epaphroditus to Paul both to bring a gift to him and to encourage his spirit I'm sure they gave Epaphroditus instructions saying, find out how Paul is doing. We want to know if he's doing okay. What are his circumstances? Find it interesting though that the letter that Paul sends back doesn't communicate to them about his specific circumstances. If I was the one in Philippi and received this letter back from Paul, I would have been looking for another page. Paul, how are you doing? We didn't get that part. It's not here. Is he healthy? Will he be released? Have the soldiers been treating him well? Yet what is it in verse 12 that Paul is focused on? Paul isn't focused on any of those questions. In fact, Paul's joy is rooted in knowledge that sees through and past his circumstances. It's not that his circumstances or our circumstances are unimportant. Rather, it's that there's something that's more important than our circumstances. Look at verse 12. He says, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have what? They've turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. It's as if he's saying, hey, there's a lot I could tell you, dear church. There's a lot I could inform you about. 
But here's the main thing. My circumstances, this imprisonment has turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. The gospel was spreading. The only thing that he says about his circumstances is that his circumstances have brought about greater kingdom progress, greater kingdom work. In fact, if we were to look over at the beginning of Romans, it was Paul's desire when he wrote the book of Romans to come and visit them. He says in verse 15 of chapter 1, So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And I'm sure that when Paul wrote those words, he was not intending through imprisonment to come and preach the gospel in Rome. When we say that God's ways are not our ways, it communicates that God's means are not our means. Paul got his wish to go to Rome. Paul even got his wish to preach in Rome. But it was through an all-expenses-paid jail ministry. It wasn't through the platform of an amazingly successful, large-scale missions organization. It was through imprisonment. Could Paul have ever dreamed that this would be the way that he would bring the gospel to Rome? Would anyone have dreamed this up as the best way to make sure the gospel was presented to the most influential and important city in the Roman Empire? As we look back on our own lives, we can see God's hand of leading and guiding and edits in our life. And we can say, God, I would not have chosen this, but I see that you're using it for good. I see that you're using this, that I might be a light for you in the midst of a dark world. That's what Paul is saying here. Through chains as a prisoner of Christ, Paul brings the gospel in house arrest, chained to a Roman guard. If there was ever an applicable statement of captive audience, that was it. Listen to what MacArthur says. He says, Paul was chained night and day to a Roman soldier. He had no privacy when he ate, when he slept, when he wrote, when he prayed, or when he preached, taught, or visited with friends. Yet for a period of two years, this very lack of privacy made it impossible for the Roman soldiers guarding him to avoid hearing the gospel and witnessing Paul's remarkable Christlikeness. End quote. Roman soldiers were not known as teddy bears that you'd want to buddy up with and potentially offend while you're chained to them in bringing the gospel. Maybe Satan was pleased that he had limited Paul's reach to this Roman soldier that was chained to his arm. He could contain the zeal of Paul to this crusty soldier. For Satan's plan of gospel compromise and gospel distraction, this would have been a 15 on a scale of 1 to 10. And yet, the powerful nature of the work of God breaks through human understanding. It breaks through what we would view as being efficient and productive. The advancement of the gospel cannot be stopped by difficult circumstances because God himself cannot be stopped. It breaks any chains, crosses any obstacles, destroys any cultural, physical, economical, social boundaries. This is exactly what Paul says in 2 Timothy in chapter 2. He says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. For which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. So that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. And with it eternal glory. Imprisonment would not be part of my plan. (laughs) 
In fact, I'd do whatever necessary to make sure Paul didn't end up in prison so he had the freedom to speak. But God operates in ways and in realms that we can't. Listen to what Spurgeon says. Spurgeon says this, what is fate? Fate is this, whatever it is must be. But there is a difference between that and providence. Providence says whatever God ordains must be. But the wisdom of God never ordains anything without purpose. Everything in this world is working for some great end. Fate does not say that. There is all the difference between fate and providence that there is between a man with good eyes and a blind man. Providence, capital P, doesn't need our cleverness. God needs his ways and requires our molding around his divine plans. One of the things I appreciate about what Paul says here in verse 12 he talks about how the gospel is spreading because of his circumstances. But something he doesn't do is he doesn't say, oh, my circumstances aren't a big deal. This Roman soldier, he, he puts perfume on or he wears his deodorant. It's not that bad. No, he doesn't downplay his circumstances. He doesn't say it's not a big deal. He doesn't say the chains aren't painful or that it's not hard. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was extremely difficult. Sometimes downplaying can be our automatic reaction to our circumstances. But downplaying doesn't help us deal with the reality of pain or difficulty in this life. Paul doesn't make light of his circumstances. He faces the reality of the hardship that's chained to his arm and looks past that soldier and sees the hand of God that bound him. It's not that his circumstances and our circumstances are unimportant. Rather, it's that there's something more important than our circumstances. Gospel progress. Gospel progress. Another thing we need to catch in verse 13, not only did his imprisonment turn out for the greater progress of the gospel because of his influence with the Roman soldiers, but he gives us a window into why he was imprisoned. Verse 13, so that my imprisonment, why? In the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard. Paul wasn't in chains because of his difficult personality or his poor choices. His imprisonment was for the cause of Christ. He could genuinely say that his chains were working out for the great progress of the gospel and that this persecution was for the cause of Christ. Friends, we want to make sure that our conduct our speech, our attitudes are consistent with Christ, with what he has exuded, so that when and not if we are persecuted, we can say these chains are for the cause of Christ. I love the word that he uses in verse 13, for it has become well known. It has become well known. Literally in the original, Paul is saying that it has become visible or clear that his bonds are for Christ. Paul didn't just give the verbal reason for the hope that was within him. He was a picture of, he was a living color video of what it meant to have the gospel invade your heart. It wasn't just words that he gave to these Roman soldiers. It was his life. It was the actions. It was his speech. It was the way he interacted with them. What are we making visible or clear to the people that God has sovereignly placed around us? God has given us a purpose in the interactions and in the opportunities that we get. What is visible in your life? What is visible in my life? If we had a Roman soldier chained to our arms 24 <laughs> 7, 
the fly on the wall, what would they see? What would they see that is visible from us? This visible nature of the gospel had become well known through the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. I love the language that he uses here. It wasn't just these, these guards that knew and heard and could see. It was everyone else around him. I think it's safe to say that Paul's boldness and humility made him the topic of conversation among the guard. Political prisoners who were under house arrest would be in the control of the prefect and guarded personally by the soldiers of the Praetorian Guard. So these soldiers would have lots of experience with political prisoners. They would have th seen a thing or two, right? And yet what they see of Paul is so different than what they would have experienced with the average run-of-the-mill political prisoner. These soldiers were seeing the gospel lived out. Can we say from a gospel perspective that it was a bad thing that Paul was in prison? I don't think so. Can we really say that increasing difficulty in our circumstances are a bad thing if it means that our difficulty will make the gospel more visible to this dying world? I don't think so. Paul reserves judgment of his situation when confronted with the difficulty of imprisonment and instead looks for God's hand, which is always present. It is always present in our lives. Paul's influence for the gospel didn't just reach the guard. It would have been enough that he was a motivation and a witness and a testimony to the Roman guards. But again, Look what verse, verse 14 says. Not in verse 13, the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And then in 14, he says, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. His influence extended to those within the church. A faithful witness for Christ always has an external influence on the world and an internal influence in the church. The progress of the gospel was realized in two specific ways. It went forth through Paul to the Praetorian Guard as we see in verse 13. But Paul's boldness was such an encouragement to the brethren that it gave them fire in their bones to speak of Christ. The word for trusting here refers to being so convinced that one puts their confidence in something. Maybe you've been hiking before and you're going over a trail and there's a bridge ahead of you and maybe there's a log that's, that's, that's the bridge or a kind of a rickety bridge, some of these trails around Washington. And you kind of step out and put your foot on it just to make sure it can hold you. And then once you're assured, you have your full confidence that going across that bridge, you'll actually get to the other side. You begin walking across. These believers were so convinced because of the witness of Paul that they could put their full weight and that they too could be bold for the cause of Christ. The Praetorian Guard was influential and powerful. If Paul could be bold with them, the church could be bold in their realms of influence as well. Paul's courage gave them courage to speak the word without fear, as verse 14 says. Faithful gospel witness always radiates out not just to the people that have contact with us in the world, but to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, as it did for Paul. Let's look at verse 15, which brings us to our next point, the second stabilizing truth that fuels our joy in any circumstance is gospel preaching. Or if we get away from the alliteration, 
Maybe gospel witness would be a better fit. Gospel witness. Paul says in verse 16 that he is appointed for the defense of the gospel. He's appointed for the defense of the gospel. Defense here is the same word that shows up in verse 7 where he says, since both in my imprisonment and the defense and confirmation of the gospel. We know this word. It's apologia. It's where we get apologetic. Paul is appointed for the apologia of the gospel, which of course involves preaching and his teaching ministry. But it's a legal term like a lawyer would use. Paul was not concerned about defending himself, though. He was interested in defending the gospel, the truth. Verse 15 is interesting, though. Tucked into this missionary update from Paul, we get an intriguing verse in 15. Look what he says. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. We understand that Paul had those who were opposed to his ministry and that opposition didn't just originate from unbelievers. We see in his letter to Corinth, he says this in 2 Corinthians 10, for they say, speaking of his opponents, his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Ouch, imagine that showing up on your Facebook feed. Speech is contemptible and not much to look at. We can understand that Paul was personally attacked because unfortunately that is all too common outside the church. But why? Why would anyone share Christ out of a motive here, says in verse 15, to cause Paul harm? We have an interesting dynamic here. The text doesn't say that they were preaching a different or a heteros gospel like we find in Galatians chapter 1. We know that a different gospel is really no gospel at all, right? It says that they were proclaiming Christ, not some other deity. So these preachers were indeed preaching the one true gospel, but from stained or impure motives. Somehow, they were envious of the Apostle Paul. Maybe they envied his influence in the church, so they sought to preach his message and replace him rather than preaching alongside him. Paul doesn't explain their reasons. I'd love to get more information on this verse. What was happening here in this context? Maybe these preachers claimed that the reason for Paul's imprisonment was personal sin, much like Job's friends claimed right? Maybe some thought that this was God's judgment on Paul for being unfaithful to his duties. Maybe some assumed that he had compromised with Rome, and that's why he was allowed to continue to live. Regardless, Paul didn't concern himself with their impure motives and his personal pain. What is he focused on? He's focused on the spreading of the gospel. He's focused on the message they were preaching, even though they were intending to cause him pain. He makes it clear that there were those as well who were preaching from pure motives, from goodwill, out of a love for Paul and a love for the gospel. Those who loved Paul knew that he was appointed for the defense of the gospel, as the text says. Literally, they knew that he was set for the defense of of the gospel. It's like God placed him in a particular place in a particular time to present a defense for the gospel. There's a couple words here that are used for preaching in verses 15 and verses 17. Both carry different nuances of the same concept. One is that of a herald proclaiming a message. The other is that of a message being made public with the implication of broad dissemination. This was not just a pulpit. This was a lifestyle. They were preaching Christ, which is the only preaching that we have. And the moment our preaching turns to from, or turns from a declaration of Scripture and turns from announcing faith in Christ, it is no gospel at all. They were proclaiming Christ's 
And Paul did not concern himself with their motives. He concerned himself with the content of the message. If Christ was put on display before a lost and dying world, if that message went out, if the true gospel of Christ was preached and announced throughout the Greco-Roman world, what did it matter that he was the target of personal pain? What did it matter that he was under house arrest? What did it matter that he could be executed at any hour? Christ was preached. This is the same sentiment that John the Baptist has where he says what? He must increase. I must decrease. Look at verse 18. This is just amazing. Paul says in verse 18, What then? What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. You rejoicing, Paul? You rejoicing? You have joy? That doesn't make sense. Look at your circumstances. Those around you are trying to cause you distress by preaching your message. You're under house arrest. You might be executed. What do you mean that you're rejoicing? He's rejoicing in the, in the truth, rejoicing in the message that's going out. What I would be feeling at this time is that I'd be rejoicing in the preaching that was out of good motives, that was out of love for Paul. But I'd be waiting for God to smite those other people <laughs> that were preaching out of motives that were not right. Not for Paul whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. In good or evil circumstances, the gospel is going forth. Is that our outlook? Can we be the target of personal attack and look through the fog of personal pain and see that Christ is put on display? And can we say in our hearts, I rejoice. Only through the Spirit's working in us can we ever say that. Paul says, what then? Or in our vernacular, what does it matter? What does it matter? Remember, joy always finds roots that are deeper than the temporary circumstances. Joy is not rooted in emotions or circumstances. That's happiness. The roots of biblical joy don't grow on the surface. They grow a taproot that goes down deep to the character of God. It's not that we shouldn't be happy with the blessings of friendship and family and relationship and the good gifts that God gives. But if the circumstantial flower of blessing is scorched by our circumstances, the roots of joy are found in the deeper realities than our own existence. They're found in the progress of kingdom work, of the gospel for which we are each set by God in different realms to present an apologia with our lives and with our words. Earlier in the chapter, Paul found joy in the Philippians' participation in the gospel in verse 5. In verse 6, he found joy in the confidence that he had that God was going to sanctify them and one day glorify them. And in verse 18, he finds joy in preaching, in the preaching of Christ, even if people meant to cause him distress. As I was thinking about uh, this situation in particular, I mean, we think about one of the greatest revivals that we have in biblical history would be that of Jonah. He preaches to Nineveh. And what were Jonah's motivations? God, destroy them, please. Okay, I'll go do it, but destroy them. And yet God used his message in the hearts of the Ninevites and caused a great repentance. Maybe something similar was happening here. Let's look at the last stabilizing truth that fuels our joy in any circumstance 
Paul says at the end of verse 18, at the beginning of verse 19, yes, I will rejoice for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul affirms his current outlook of joy. He says, yes, I will rejoice. He knew that his circumstances would turn out for his deliverance. One day, Paul would be delivered from prison and delivered from the accusations and attempts of those who were trying to afflict him. Our understanding of what Paul means that he'll be delivered is nuanced by verse 20. Look at verse 20. He says, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. So deliverance for Paul could have been through the ultimate deliverance of God taking him through death or it could have been release from prison. But whether he was living or dying, he was carried by the prayers of the saints and empowered by the Spirit. I love this window into the effectiveness and the importance of prayer in verse 18. God sovereignly ordains every event, and yet, what does Paul say? In verse 19, he says, for I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. How? Yes, through God's sovereignty, but also through your prayers. Through your prayers. And the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful blending of God's sovereignty and our responsibility to pray. The outcome of his very circumstances involved the prayers of the Philippians that they were making on his behalf. The prayer of the saints wasn't just an encouragement to Paul in his ministry. It was imperative to the effectiveness of his ministry. It wasn't just their prayers empowered Paul It was also the provision of the Holy Spirit. Two forces for spiritual effectiveness in the church, prayer and the Holy Spirit. The word for provision here is the same word that's used of a ligament that serves to support. I love that mental picture. That is what the Holy Spirit was doing in and through Paul. Paul might be put to shame before the Roman courts or before the eyes of those who wanted to cause him distress. But he knew that he would never be put to shame before the throne of heaven because of the efficacious work of Jesus Christ to take that shame, to take his sin, and to give him hope. I want you to catch one last thing here in this text. A nuance of one of the words that's used in verse 20 says that he wants Christ to be exalted. Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body. The word that is translated here, exalted, could be translated to cause to be large, megaluno. He's setting his heart and his mind so that Christ would be made large in his circumstances. Not that Paul would be made large or his reputation would be made large, but that Christ himself would be made large in this dying world. How is Christ being made large in our lives? Out of the overflow of all of this, one of the most popular verses in Philippians comes on the heels of the text that we look at. In verse 21, he says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I hope that you'll put that verse in your mind. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain with the understanding of what he's already communicated in verses 12 through 20. The context of what Paul was experiencing. I don't know what we will face in these uncertain times, but I know what was certain for Paul. 
in the midst of uncertainty. There was gospel progress. God used imprisonment for the greater progress of the gospel and he will use our circumstances in the very same way. He was convinced of gospel witness and its effect on those around him were all set or placed by God in strategic locations for the apology or the defense of the gospel through our lives and through our words. And there's also the provision of the gospel through the Holy Spirit and through prayer. Let me end with a quote that I found from a commentator on the life of John Bunyan says this, John Bunyan's preaching was so popular and powerful and so unacceptable to leaders in the 17th century Church of England that he was jailed in order to silence him. Refusing to be silent, he began to preach in the jail courtyard. He not only had a large audience of prisoners, but also hundreds of the citizens of Bedford and the surrounding area would come to the prison daily and stand outside to hear him expound scripture. He was silenced verbally by being placed deep inside the jail and forbidden to preach at all. Yet in that silence, he spoke loudest of all and to more people than he could have imagined. It was during that time that he wrote Pilgrim's Progress, the great Christian classic that has ministered the gospel to tens of millions throughout the world. For several centuries, it was the most widely read and translated book in the world after the Bible. Bunyan's opponents were able to stop his preaching for a few years, but they were not able to stop his ministry. Instead, they provided opportunity for it to be extended from deep within jail in the small town of Bedford to the ends of the earth. That is how our God works, friends. We're going to prepare our hearts for the Lord's table now, and as we reflect in our own hearts this morning, we're going to have a, a moment to dwell on the goodness of Jesus as we take communion, confess any sin that we need to bring to our Savior. The ordinance of communion, we remember the new covenant that Jesus made through the shedding of his blood. We remember the atoning death and the precious blood that was poured out for our sins, and we also assess our own hearts in this process. Communion is for the believer this morning who has been saved and justified and redeemed because of the blood of Jesus. For those who have embraced the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God is holy, that man has sinned against their creator, that God has provided the way of salvation through his son and through his death on the cross and that Jesus bore the full wrath of God on our behalf. And if we put our trust in his work, we will be saved. If you have not submitted your life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, just let the elements pass you by, and I would encourage you to talk with the men in front after the service. Let me pray for us, and then the men will serve us. Let's pray. Father, we come to you as those who are needy and helpless. We come to you as those who can only approach your throne because of the amazing work of Jesus on our behalf. We praise you for your plan of redemption and now we remember you. Remember your work, that your body was broken for us. That your blood was poured out to cleanse us from sin and to reconcile us with holy God. Lord, thank you for your work on the cross on our behalf. I pray that our lives would represent you well. In Jesus' name.